Right, Michelle. Yes. First of all, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. This is nice. It's like a little, little break from the convention. You close those doors. It's, really and it's nice. like really being like in your living room. It's a little oasis. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to tell a bit by yourself uh, for the people that you know don't know you or the the younger people? You know, I where you're coming from and stuff. I I'm from uh, New York and I own Daredevil Tattoo on the Lower East Side. We're kind of Lower East Side Chinatown, and uh, we open. I own Daredevil with my business partner Brad Fink, and Brad and I know each other since high school. I grew up in St. Louis, and uh, we opened up Daredevil in 1997 when tattooing was legalized in New York City. It was banned from 1961 until 97, and I actually started tattooing in 91. And uh, so I worked for six years underground before they um, legalized it again. How was that? Uh, it was great. It was, um, you know, it was a much smaller community. Uh, everybody kind of, you knew who everybody was. Maybe not everybody liked everybody, but uh, you definitely uh, were familiar with everybody. And they used to have uh, the tattoo society meetings at CBGBs. And um, it was... Uh, much different vibe, you know, and at the time, a lot of, everybody's always surprised that tattooing was illegal in New York until so late, but honestly, when I started tattooing, nobody I knew wanted it to be legal because it kept all the competition out, mm. and so we knew as soon as it was legalized that um, the floodgates would open and there would be, um, you know, a hundred shops everywhere, which is what happened. But my reaction when I first heard it was going to be legalized was like, oh, no, now I have to open up a tattoo shop. Yeah. So I had like the setup where you would, uh, it was on the second floor in this loft space and people would yell up and you would throw the keys out the window at them. <laughs> was it like secret words and stuff to get in? Uh, no, I mean, I used to advertise in the back of the Village Voice. It was That was the other reason we didn't mind it being illegal, because it was completely unenforced. I think in the 30-something years it was illegal. Nobody was ever actually busted. I, I used to tattoo cops all the time. They, they didn't care. That's um, nice. It was, uh, I think, more more of a health code violation. So, if anything, you could have gotten like a summons or something. But mm -hmm. um, one time, I looked up the law, and it was listed in between um, smoking on elevators and uh, growing pot or growing poison ivy in the city. Oh, dude, that's so a good deal. <laughs> it was. Uh, so we were sitting pretty, kind of. Because now, imagine, like you said, you had this society that do the meetings. Mm -hmm. And I imagine like a secret handshake and a secret doors and wearing capes and shit. I, if only. But um, it was it was cool though because we used to have tattoo. Mike was at the door, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He used to be the tattooed man at Coney Island, and he's passed away. You know, years ago. I think he passed away like '96, maybe. And he was in that. Um, there was that photograph of him where he kind of reproduced that Diane Arbus photo of, of Jack Dracula. And the uh, one that's like laying down? Yeah, yeah. and Tattoo Mike, like his <coughs> whole face was tattooed and he kind of had the Jack Dracula sort of like eye thing. And, uh, and back then in the early 90s, you didn't see people like that around. And, you know, there I don't think there was anyone else really, maybe one or two people in the world that were... I mean, at the time, he was the world's most tattooed man, and uh, so he was the one who would do the door at the Tattoo Society meetings, and, you know, the first time to go there and to see him in see person, it was crazy, and, and he was so sweet and, you know, just the kindest person that you could meet, and uh, so that definitely made an impression on me and probably everybody else back then. Yeah. I hope some very good pictures exist of this time, of this, you know... There was, I think somebody's actually doing a documentary. Uh, somebody is doing a documentary about Tattoo Mike right now. And uh, he was photographed by Andy Warhol. And uh, he was, he did like the human pin cushion and the, uh, the nail through the tongue. And uh, mm -hmm. he did the whole sideshow thing. And you started tattooing in 91, mm -hmm. right? How was that to start tattooing in those days when it was illegal and uh, you knew you're a woman? You know, like, how, how was how was your start? Um, it was, uh, I didn't 
have an apprenticeship like um, people normally would because there were no shops to apprentice at, but uh, since it was illegal. Uh, so I think maybe, if anything, it was kind of in my favor. I didn't really have that experience, that sort of gatekeeping thing, because I didn't walk into a shop and have, you know, someone laugh me out of it. But uh, back then in New York, if you started tattooing, you went down to Unimax on Canal Street and you bought a starter kit. And that was pretty much how most people started out back then. And uh, I had, uh, I was friends with Sean Vasquez, actually. He helped me, you know, kind of pointed me in the right direction for how to make needles and stuff like that. And uh, so I'd say I sort of fumbled along a bit, and then we opened up um, East Side Inc. on St. Mark's Place. We had uh, an apartment space, and we kind of created this uh, co-op type situation. And it was uh, me and Andrea Elston and Sean Vasquez and Josh Moody and Bill Beccio. And so we all worked out of this apartment together and... Uh, at some point when the lease was up on that space, I moved down to Ludlow Street by myself, and they moved to Second Street. And um, at all, I think around that time, I also I got a job at a legal street shop out in Jersey. And I, I always say that's really what taught me how to tattoo, because since it was illegal in New York, a lot of people went out to Jersey to get tattooed. And this particular shop was in a really good situation because they banned tattooing in the town, and so it was... They would um, get older. Nobody else could open up. They were <coughs> grandfathered in. And so I would take the bus out there and just sit down when they opened at noon. And I'd tattoo until 10 at night. You know, it was all J.D. Crow Flash. Nice. And sometimes I wouldn't even be able to have lunch. And, you know, and that's what taught me how to tattoo more mm. than anything. And what is the thing, if there is something, but what is the thing that you miss most of these days? Uh, I, I miss maybe how, um, outlaw it was like, not just in the legal sense, but also, uh, you know, it was so powerful back then to be a woman, to have tattoos and to be a man that was heavily tattooed. Um, you know, people <coughs> thought you were out there, you know, people like really avoided you and, you know, were kind of afraid of it. And, uh, so that, that was kind of cool that it had that, like that power, power. in that you know, um, the rough impact the, the on people, yeah. you know, and, and that was really fun. And that it, and just to top it off that it was actually illegal, you know, it was, was pretty cool and it differentiated it a lot from, you know, other cities. And I think, um, it, at the same time though, I think it also sort of like maybe in some ways hindered, uh, New York city's, tattoo scene because a lot of tattooers moved out to like the west coast like marcus pacheco and um like timothy hoyer and a lot of those um a lot of like the really good tattooers you know ended up leaving new york because they wanted to go work and you know in like a shop environment and have that and uh you know, I, I enjoy having my shop, and it wasn't until after I started working in the shop that I realized how nice that environment was. And I mm. feel like maybe working by myself, you know, hindered me for a while because you don't learn as much when you're... You don't have influence. And right. <coughs> and I was definitely not taught the right way. And a lot of... I, I feel like to this day, I'm not as efficient of a tattooer as maybe I could have been if I had really had a good guiding hand to start mm. out. You know what? I find fascinating the fact that for good and for bad, it's always like not just one yeah. way to look at things. But when you shake something, the you know, like just the outside circumstances create something that you couldn't plan. Meaning, for example, in this case, the the ban, right? Mm -hmm. And then somehow shape the dynamics that made New York tattooing what it became eventually. Because it forced some people out, it forced some people in, it forced people to adapt. Mm -hmm. You know, so somehow those external circumstances shape and make that something unique because you can't recreate it somewhere else because it's not made on purpose. Yeah. You know, so I find that fascinating. It was also a weird scene because, um, you know, at the time, Jonathan Shaw was uh, editing the tattoo magazine. You know, he was editing Outlaw Biker and then ITA. And so Jonathan wouldn't publish any other tattooers besides him or anyone that worked for him so people like uh really didn't have a sense of like the larger scene of tattooing unless you were actually in new york mm. and uh so when they legalized it again like how did it change for you how 
Uh, well, I opened up the shop. I mean, uh, Brad would come up and visit me in New York, and he was always like, oh, if they open, you know, if they legalize tattooing, let's open a shop together. And I had, like, just gotten this loft space that I was working out of, and I had spent all this money renovating it to work out of it. And uh, it, so it kind of forced me to get a business partner. And, you know, I was used to doing things by myself, and uh, and that was a really good thing having Brad come in and be my partner because uh, the shop, you know, just having those two energies and having like more people, you know, like what I said before, it's, it's better when you benefit from having people around you and not just doing everything yourself. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was, it was definitely shocking. And I remember like really staying away from all the stuff that was going on with the legalization. Cause I was sort of, of the mindset like, hey, let's just keep our heads down and, you know, and do this. We don't know what they're going to do to us if maybe they're just trying to lure us out or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I, I was kind of freaked out by the whole situation and it wasn't it wasn't happy news for me at the time, but it all worked out in the end. Yeah, you got to eventually, you know, you adapt like yeah. everything. <laughs> and I'm holding in front of me this beautiful map that you made. We were talking about before, like how I love attention to detail because, you know, it says a lot about how you do things and just the way this is crafted is very beautiful but so this this is a map for this thing uh which says here in the cover daredevil tattoo museum map of new york city tattoo history the bowery etc etc right um what is it and uh, how did this happen how did you end up what was the gestation for this and um, in 2014, we moved the shop to the location that we're at now, and uh, we moved about seven blocks south from where we used to be. And uh, so when we moved down there, we were trying to figure out how to set up the space. And uh, I told Brad, you know, Brad already had amassed this, like, crazy collection, and uh I was like, wow, it'd be really cool if you hung up a few original things in the shop when we were trying to decide how to set it up. And Brad kind of looked around. He was like, I could fill this whole place up. And so that was what we did. And so we had our ta instant tattoo museum, basically. And uh, it made me more interested in the history of the area and the history of like where exactly all the tattooers were working. And because, uh, of course, there was Mike McCabe's book and he has like a rough like sort of thumbnail of, you know, where a couple guys were working. Um, but I wanted to like really go through and be like, okay, who was the first and, you know, and figure out like all the different addresses. And so I started trying to figure out who the first person was. I started reading, you know, about Martin Hildebrandt and I found that a lot of the information online was wrong or contradictory. And, uh, so I just kept digging and digging and, um, you know, the more you dig, the more you find and, it was like one thing about Hildebrand. Everybody, all the stuff I could find, it all said that he opened up the first tattoo shop in um, 1846. But it turns out he wasn't actually listed in New York until 1858. And uh, the 1846 was because that was when he started tattooing. So if you mm. go back and read the actual articles, he was like, I started tattooing in 1846 aboard the SS United States with old uh, Patty Reed, Commodore Reed, and uh, it turned out there was a United States uh, and there was a Commodore Reed, but his name was Thomas Reed, but he was from Ireland, so I guess the men called him Patty Reed. And, um, and that ship, the United States, was actually the same ship that Herman Melville served on just two years before him. Um, so I don't know. It's like just the more I dug into it, the more and more rich and exciting it's it like was to work. me. Yeah. Like you, like you, I guess you had to go through old newspapers and archives and stuff like that. Yeah. All that. And you know, like one thing was all of the old listings, they said that Hildebrandt worked at 36 and a half Oak street, but there is no Oak street in New York city. So I went to the library and they have these big maps from back then. This and, so uh, cool. And I found that that area where Hildebrandt was, it was all raised in 1946 um, for the Alfred Smith houses that are there now. So, uh, you know, just it was just so interesting to bring this stuff to life. And, you know, and the more you dig, the more you find and the more pieces you put together. And to illustrate it like this was um, 
it was pretty cool and it was very gratifying because even people who know like a lot about tattoo history when I made the map and they would look at it um, like they were even surprised to see like how close together all these guys were it's a visual, you know like when I open it I see actually it's illustrated on both sides it's foldable in three parts but then both sides uh, have different things one more text but one has a proper map and you really see the corners of the street with the numbers with everything and like you say, you see visually, like, oh, they were that close, like two blocks. Yeah, they're just jammed into, <coughs> like, three or four blocks there, and they were all in that spot. I mean, you know, there were a few other places, like, kind of dispersed, you know, farther out. But to see, like, how many people were just in those couple little blocks from, like, Chatham Square to Canal Street is crazy. And why do you think specifically in this area, because there must be some condition favorable, like, oh, there is more people, more business, or more whatever, whatever, easy access, or some reason, right? Why do you think they were more concentrated on this specific area? Um, I mean, for one thing, uh, Chatham Square and the Bowery, they were world famous at the time. It's just if you were to go to New York City and you wanted to have fun and get in trouble, do some drinking, do some fighting, you went to the Bowery. And, and what's crazy to me is that um, the Bowery became the Bowery uh, partly due to the natural geography of New York City. Um, you know, Manhattan started on the very southernmost tip of Manhattan, settled by the Dutch. And at the bottom of the Bowery in Chatham Square is where Five Points used to be. And, you know, everyone's heard of Five Points because of Gangs of New York. But it turns out before Five Points was there, there was a pond there, and that was the original water source for New York City. And uh, it was the Collect Pond, and that was why the Bowery was there. It was um, The Bowery is the oldest uh, thoroughfare in New York City. It started out as a Native American footpath that went from the bottom of Manhattan to the top. And... Um, so people would use the Bowery to come down to get to the Collect Pond. and uh, But eventually you had like these businesses that opened up around that pond and you had like breweries and tanneries and slaughterhouses. But in the 1700s, the basically the worst polluters were breweries, tanneries and slaughterhouses. So the Collect Pond became too polluted to use anymore. And so they decided to fill it in and build on top but they didn't know how to properly drain the area. So all of the buildings they built there, they all started to sink. Oh, dude. And so it became a very undesirable place to live. If you, um, you know, were living there, it's like there was, you know, moisture coming up from the foundations of the buildings. There were puddles of like, Smells you know, the and smell and yeah. like mosquitoes breeding and everything. And so that's why it became this like, like terrible slum is because it, you know, just, you know, because of that geography that was there. And then what really kind of like was the nail in the coffin for like the Bowery becoming um, Skid Row was in, I think it was 1757. Uh, uh, um, I don't do my tours as much as I used to after COVID, so my brain's a little fuzzy. But um, they decided to build an elevated train along the Bowery. And uh, and when they put the train up, it's like the train was loud, and back then it was coal or wood fired, so like uh, it was dirty, and it cut out all the sunlight going down to the street. That and place so sounds really bad to live. <laughs> yeah, so the property values tanked at that point, and uh, you know, and anybody who was wearing nice clothes was not going to go hang out on the Bowery because you had like the soot and the ashes and stuff coming down from the train, so it became like this place with all of this entertainment, all of these like bars and, you know, theaters and brothels and stuff like that. And so it was cheap. And so also another, you had the crowds, but then also it was affordable. And so the tattooers found their way there. And like on Chatham Square, you know, one of the, the earlier tattooers to work there was Samuel O'Reilly and, you know, and like Getchell and uh, number five, Chatham Square, was the original location for the Chatham Square Museum. Um, you had the dime museums there. And so that was another thing that, like, you know, drew crowds in. And the dime museums were, um, you know, people would pay a dime and you could go in, you'd look at all the um, attractions. They would have the freak shows and everything. And every respectable dime museum had a tattooed man and tattooed lady and even a tattoo artist working out of it. And so I think, like, since O'Reilly was one of the earliest ones to work on the Bowery, um, 
you know, he had that location of the Chatham Square Museum. And so I think from there, it's like it, it grew from that specific block. And what are these places today? Just, I guess, businesses um, and... I'm, I'm super sad right now because I just recently found uh, a picture online of uh, the old Chatham Square Museum, like the actual space. And I had seen il illustrations of this photo and, um, and it, was a, it was a line drawing and it said like a tattooer on the front of the museum. But I found this photograph and it actually says Samuel O'Reilly tattooer on it. And... Uh, and you can confirm that it's it because right next to it is another building and there's this like architectural detail there and and it was still there and that building just came down like two weeks ago. Oh, dude. They demolished that building yeah. and so it really bummed me out. But um, I mean, when I first started doing the tours, um, you know, I do these walking tours through Airbnb experiences. And when I first started doing the tours, people were like, eh, there's nothing on the Bowery. But, you know, a lot of times you just have to look a little bit closer. And, you know, the facade might be like, you know, um, like 11 Chatham Square where O'Reilly and Wagner worked. It's like, okay, it's just this boring pharmacy, you know. But then, you know, you look up and you can see the architectural details or you can find, like, the old pictures and you can match them to, you know, a lot of the locations. And, you know, sadly, a lot of this stuff is gone. And, you know, in the Bowery, even though it's uh, listed on our nat National Register of Historic Places, that doesn't actually give it any architectural protections. That would be up to the city. So unfortunately, they can tear down like a 200-year-old row house and build a luxury tower. Mm. But, you know, that's, uh, I guess, you know, that's part of what makes New York New York is that it's always building on top of itself. Yeah. Like, uh, it <coughs> makes me think of, uh, I used to live in Copenhagen, and there is this place uh, called Nihau. Mm -hmm. The Danish people will be horrified at my pronunciation, but there is this place which is the uh, means Old Harbor, and basically that's where uh, Tatuole and all these people, you know, Tatu Jack, and mm -hmm. that's where they had shop. And it's the same thing. People would go there to, you know, strip clubs, fight, get drunk, and the sailor would come in and get tattooed and stuff like that. And um, it's the same thing. They have uh, one of the oldest shop. Uh, I think at least in this hemisphere, mm -hmm. which turned into a century or something, and it's uh, Nihon 17. And it's still a tattoo shop today, but the old block is uh, owned by uh, a guy that has a restaurant next to it, and then there is a tattoo shop, and you want to just to expand the restaurant and just put that down. So the whole world basically mobilized through oh, this petition to, yeah. Yeah, to save the place. And mm -hmm. they managed to make it recognized as a historical value of some sort. Mm -hmm. So it's still a tattoo shop, even if it's, you know, the management keep changing, but, you know. Yeah, it's um, like where Hildebrandt first worked, like all those addresses are completely gone. Like I said, that whole area was wiped out in 1947. Um, but it's still interesting to me because if you go to that corner where Hildebrandt used to work, it's like it's all public housing now, so there's not anything to look at architecturally. But if you stand in that spot, Hildebrandt worked up until uh, 1885, and like the Brooklyn Bridge was finished in 1883. So you stand there and you can see the Brooklyn Bridge, and so you imagine without the high rises there, it's like Hildebrandt would have been able to be there and watch that entire expanse mm -hmm. being built. And when you think of what an impact the Brooklyn Bridge had on New York City, you know, and just, I mean, no one had ever attempted something like that in the world, you know, the an expansion bridge like that, um, you know, that massive. And so it's still kind of cool, even though, like, in that particular area, there's nothing left. It's still cool to stand there and be like, wow, Hildebrandt saw that being built. You know, he was right here. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, and the thing was that area, you know, it was uh, one of the gnarliest slums in the world. And at one point, uh, actually, the, the foot of the Manhattan side of the Brooklyn Bridge was where the first presidential mansion was, where George Washington used to live. And so it used to be a nice area because it was so close to the waterfront. And so you had all the trading and businessmen and, you know, and stuff like that. But at some point, you know, just the more and more immigrants that came in, the more run down it got. And the rich people didn't want to live there anymore. And, and it became, you know, super dangerous place. Like when Hildebrandt was working there, 
it uh you know like the police wouldn't even go down there unless they were in groups of five or six together <sighs> because it was so dangerous and uh and actually gangs of new york um that was based on an actual uh gang war that happened in uh it was july 4th um 1856 and it was just like it was like one year or 1854 you're like an encyclopedia <laughs> I'm a little fuzzy on the exact date, I wish I would, but it was, I could be that fuzzy. it was one year before Hildebrandt was listed as tattooing. So that gang war was the same time that Hildebrandt was working. And so by the 40s, you know, that area, it was, it was such a slum and it was so dangerous and stuff. It wasn't anything that anybody wanted to preserve. And so that was why, you know, just the whole area was wiped out. Um, you know, because it, it wasn't something that people saw value in. And, you know, and one thing that's uh, really interesting to me, you know, from the time I've started tattooing, um, you know, like in when I first started tattooing in the 90s, tattooing was this dangerous, dirty, you know, intimidating thing. But also the Lower East Side, my neighborhood, it was this dangerous, dirty, scary place. And, uh, it's I feel like the two have like run on these like parallel courses together because you know it's like tattooing's grown up into what it is now, and now the lower east side has luxury condos and you know it's like my my old block that like it used to be taxi cabs wouldn't even come to where Daredevil was <laughs> because it was so raunchy down there um and now it's like you know i remember like rolling stone said that like ludlow street was the hippest block in the country and now where my shop is now it's like gq is writing about it because we have they call it dime square because there's this cafe next to us called dimes and wow. you know it must be weird for you to see this and be like okay i know what he was yeah, it's i'm just glad that you know i was around for like the fun mm -hmm. times and you know i'm glad that i was around before cell phones and the internet and everything mm -hmm. but i don't know i just i just find it so fascinating that i feel like you know the lower east side new york city and tattooing have like grown up together and they've you know they're so like linked to each other and it's been interesting to see the two of them like grow into something that's so far from what it used to be what it started out as i mean i i loved the lower east side when it was you know this like intimidating place to be i mean i remember when i first moved to was trying to decide if i should move to ludlow street where i first opened daredevil i was like oh i don't know if i'm doing the right thing like leaving the people at east side you know because you know i was going to be there was no sign out front, so I was going to be starting over with a new f new phone number, and I was like, I'm going to starve to death, you know. But I go down there, and the first place I look at, it's this guy shows me this space, and he's like, all right, it's $500 a month. you got to have verifiable income, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't have any of that. I'm a tattoo artist. I work underground. And he goes, my ex-wife was a tattoo artist. <laughs> I have this place to be perfect for a the tattoo universe. shop. It was crazy. And he was like, do you need an autoclave? And <laughs> so he <laughs> sold me his first, he sold me my first autoclave and he rented me this space to tattoo out of. And his ex-wife, the tattooer, was a cook at the cafe downstairs on the weekends. That's so funny. And they had tattoo flash in this cafe. And unfortunately, you know, I was always a terrible, terrible photographer back then. And it was this really dark cafe and I never got pictures of it. But he had like five sheets of antique flash from the original. Uh, original. And, you know, and this was in 1993. And so how crazy. And I remember all these, these cops were like, don't move to Ludlow Street. It's the most, you know, it's the worst heroin block in the whole city. So I moved down there and I tattooed all the drug dealers and never had problems. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. You know what's really funny? That, that, that you have this image, you know, of, of very composed, sweet, you know, woman. And then you have this history and this is the worst blocks with the worst gangsters and stuff. It, 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 it's, it's funny. Uh, I, I'm always so thankful to tattooing and I feel like the doors that it opens. I mean, I remember one time I was going to, I don't know if you remember Robert Butcher, the photographer. He mm. used to shoot for Outlaw Biker and Easy Rider. And uh, I was doing an interview with Robert. And actually, you know what? I think that interview was for um, the second issue of uh, 
Tattoo Life for Mickey. Okay. And so Robert was doing the interview, and I went out to his place in Brooklyn, and it was in this, like, really bad area. And uh, it was before cell phones, and it was also the old school, like, you go to the cell phone, I mean, the, you know, pay phone, and you call up, and you're like, okay, I'm downstairs. And so I was on this, like, really sketchy block, and there's these guys on the corner, and they're looking at me, and, you know, and I was in my 20s, so I was, you know, dressed how I would dress in the 20s, rock and roll, <laughs> and uh, they're looking at me, and this guy's walking by, and I'm just like, oh, hey, what's up, you know, and I'm like, great, you know, they're walking over, and then the guy's like, Michelle, and I'm <laughs> like, yeah, and he's like, yo, I got tattooed at your shop, <laughs> and he, like, That's introduced so me to all his buddies, and and Robert was like, oh, all the guys were so excited to see you, <laughs> you know, and I was like, wow, it's crazy to be this girl from the Midwest and to be able to go into, you know, this, this like crazy place, crime ridden, yeah. like, you know, really sketchy place and make friends with all of the hoodlums on the block. That's so funny. And do you, th do you know, do you think there are still places that kept somewhere in the U.S., in the world, or that you know of, that you travel to? They kept a little bit of this sort of magic, or it's all gone? I think the Lower East Side has. You know, I, I feel like it's still there in my neighborhood. You know, mm -hmm. I, um, I'm really happy since I moved to the location that we're at. Um, as much as I loved Ludlow where I was, it's like this new location. We're a little bit farther south. And since it's in Chinatown, uh, it's a little bit slower to gentrify. Um, you know, because a lot of the Chinese will only rent to other it's Chinese. Circle, and yeah. so that's kind of like, it's happening. I mean, it's definitely happening, um, but it's a little bit slower and it's like legs behind, you know, some other areas. And like when I moved there, I felt like uh, one of my friends was like, yo, that's the last good spot, you know, because everything else has been just, you know, it's kind of gross how, you know, things have changed in some ways. But uh it, it's still definitely, it, it has flavor, you know, it has like, um, you know, that like grittiness to it still. And, and I en enjoy that, you know, and I think if there's anything, I always say like, I, I wish I would have known back then that someday everything would be gone, you know, because I would have, you know, savored it more. And so now it's like, I, you know, I tried to savor it, even though, you know, one by one, you know, the places disappear mm. and go away. Like, when we moved to where we are now, there was this little store around the corner from us that I was like, that's my favorite store. I'd never been in it. But it was this accordion store, and it was this tiny little accordion store, and it said the world's biggest accordion store. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was so cool. And then a few months after we moved in, the guy who owned it died, you know? And so it's like not only do you have to worry about, like, rents going up and people getting priced out, it's like, you know, other stuff happens and mm. you know and it changes and it's gone you know and so it's like you really have to savor what's around you you know because it doesn't last yeah and you're doing these tours now of course to preserve this and to you know make to honor it and then to uh, make people able to relive somehow this history how how does it work how do you approach this um well we uh like we did a Kickstarter when we first moved to our space and uh, that we were opening the museum. And uh, it was um, it was really great because it gave us a real sense of how much people supported, you know, us doing what we were trying to do. Um, we had so many people that, you know, contributed and like really got involved with it. And uh, so I had been working on this and I thought, oh, you know, it'd be cool it's like for the top donor to have like make a walking tour. Mm. And um, so I did that and, uh, you know, and all these people were like, oh, I want to go on your tour. And it's like, oh, yeah, sure. And, you know, and it never happens. And then um, Airbnb launched their experiences thing and they came in and they were like, hey, we want a tattoo experience. Is there anything you could? And I was like, oh, well, it happened. How did you find out? Um, they just came to us because they knew we had the museum mm. and they were just launching it. And so they were kind of approaching, you know, different people. And uh, so it was kind of perfect because it, you know, gave me a platform for it and to a way to actually schedule it. And, uh, you know, and sometimes when it's like, um, you know, got to wake up early to go to the shop, to go give a tour. Like I do them usually on Fridays, like once a week. And um, 
you know, and sometimes when I'm dragging myself there early, I'm kind of like, oh, why am I doing this, you know? And But then I'll, like, meet, like, some of the, you know, best people. And it's like, I'll, it'll be like, you know, I'll show up and it's some tattooers and or it's just some tattoo people. And, and they're so into it and so excited. And, and I'm like, oh, this is why I do it, you know, because I meet really great people. And it's also beneficial for me because um, I'm working on a book right now for New York City tattoo history book and and I find I feel that like giving the tours um, it really uh, helps me to tell the story and it helps me understand like what people are interested in what people uh, you know how to better explain things to yeah, them. Yeah, how to receive the information. And yeah, it really helps me like organize it in my head and, and it is really nice to have these connections with people and to be able to, um, you know, share it with people in such a direct way. Did you have people that wrote you after or something and either they, of course, I'm sure some people be like, oh, that was great, thank you so much, this and that, or people that wanted to know more and maybe ask you like, oh, how can I know more about this or someone that didn't expect it was going to be like that and then they really got into it. Oh yeah, I mean, when I first started doing them like, you know, Airbnb had just launched it and so it was new and uh I the second tour I did, it was this older guy. I show up and you know, I'm trying to like break the ice. I'm like, "Oh, you got any tattoos?" He's like, "Nah." He's like, "Do you want to know the uh, truth?" And I'm like, "Yeah, all right." And he goes, "I actually hate tattoos." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> you know, and so I go on the You're tour the right with place. them. And he was like, yeah, I was scrolling through the thing. I was like, oh, watch that be the only one available today. And it was. And uh, and then by the end of the tour, like, this guy was my best buddy. And now, like, any time he comes to New York, he, he calls me up and he's like, oh, you want to go get lunch? You know, and I love your tour. Or if he sees, like, he lives in, like, Ohio. And if he sees, like, a flyer for a tattoo convention, he's like, hey, they're having a tattoo convention here. Are you going to come for it? And the guy was a social worker. Mm. And he was an older guy. And so so for him, tattoos were represented like, you know, people yeah, having stigma, problems yeah. and stuff. And, uh, and so that, w that was pretty cool. You know, this is a guy who like, he was kind of like actively hostile to tattoos. And now mm. like, he's my buddy. <laughs> That's so funny. And do you have any favorite spot or any favorite element of this that you particularly connected to or did um i you know i, I love that like millie hall's uh space is still there that building is still there it's an original building and like apache harry's building is still there and they still like you know i i have photos that you can you know match to the time and uh probably my favorite address on there is uh number 40 bowery um uh, there's 40, 42 Bowery. It's these two matching row houses that are next to each other. They're the two brick row houses. And 42 Bowery, um, Professor Ted Hazard worked there. And I, I don't I don't know, really know much about him. He was mentioned in Albert Perry's book that I guess his career ended early due to an unfortunate tattoo removal incident. Okay. <laughs> um, but what's cool about the building is that 40 Bowery uh, used to be the headquarters for the Bowery Boys. And when that gang war broke out that was in gangs of New York between the Bowery Boys and the Dead Rabbits, that's the actual location where mm. that gang war started. And so That's the guy with a mustache with a knife in the movie. Uh yeah, I you know, I don't know, like I can't remember how it was portrayed yeah. in the movie, but that that like actually started there in real life and so I think that's pretty cool that mm. it's still there and you know, imagine if those walls could talk. I mean now there's like the renewed day spa is there and everybody gets massages there. It's mm. their favorite spot and it's really cheap. But New York <laughs> New York is a magical place, like for many things. Like now we talk about tattoos. I'm sure that mm -hmm. is the same, you know, rich heritage for many other things, right? Different fields and stuff. But it really is a special place because some things the way they have been and even the way they are and the way it will be, you know? It's it's you can you don't have the same somewhere else you know with the same flavor it know. has that um you know it truly is you know it's that whole melting pot thing i mean it's like you had all these different mm. cultures you know coming together you know right there in the lower east side especially i mean you know lower east side is you know very near and dear to my heart i mean it's like you know probably the two things that have had the biggest influence on my life you know is tattooing in the lower east side and uh and it's like 
anyone can belong there. You know, like in, if you go to California, California is like much more sort of status based. Like, you know, you're driving, you know, what car you drive and stuff like that. But like New York City, it's like even like, you know, you have this crazy derelict bum that like lives on your street. It's like people are still looking out for him and you know, anybody can fit in there. You know, it doesn't matter if you have the money, if you don't have money, if you're a weirdo or, you know, you're straight laced or whatever. It's like, uh, you know, it's just this place that, you know, anybody can exist on their own terms and, you know, and be accepted. And I just, I love the energy of it. I love that, you know, it, I, you know, I didn't, I mean, I haven't been everywhere, but I feel like it's probably the most diverse place there is. You know, it's just every culture is in New York City and they're all like bumped up next to each other. You know, it's like there's such a concentration. You know, you have like, like, you know, London is so, so like sprawling, you know, whereas Manhattan is, it's an island. And so it can't like Go to. get any bigger than what it is. And so it's like people are literally, you know, building up on top of each other. And so it, it's, it's cool that you have, um, you know, such close proximity you don't have to walk very far to you know make these like connections like right by us there's uh there used on allen street there used to be another elevated train and uh i heard this like crazy story from this older woman in the neighborhood she said that on to the west of allen street was little 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 italy and and to the east was um a jewish area and so she said that the uh the Jewish men would go to the West, to the Italian side prostitutes, and then the Italian men would go to the Jewish prostitutes because they didn't want the ladies, like, talking to, you know, getting back to uh, their right. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, this is something that, you know, this lady was, like, 80 years old, and she grew up there, and so that's this little tiny tidbit that you wouldn't find in a book, but she was just like, oh, yeah, no, they wouldn't go, they would go over there, and, you know, they didn't want their wives to hear because if the Italians went to the Italian prostitutes, then, you know, they might here for the other Italian ladies and so I don't know That's it's just so wild that you have all these little things like interconnected and so close together yeah but the cool thing is that this stuff you can't find on the internet you mm -hmm. know even in a world where everything is available right away that it I like there are still things where okay you want to really know about this you gotta go there you gotta get to meet the right people and they're gonna tell you those things yeah there's this oral so this history is, uh, mm. and um if you would have to think about why is, could be important, I would say why is, in some opinions, yeah, why could be important to learn about history of tattooing for, you know, especially tattooers, especially the younger generations? Why, why would that be valuable for them? I mean, I guess, uh, you know, everything's just so kind of weird now, you know, the way that the internet has, um, you know, twisted so many things. I mean, it's just like, it's just uh, this kind of, um, bizarre relationship between, you know, how, you know, internet savvy someone is and, you know, how busy they are, you know, it's, and I think it's like to have this, like, go back to this time, you know, and to appreciate this time when it wasn't just about, like, having this technological savviness with your business. And, um, like, when I first started getting tattooed, it's like, I always liked, you know, when I first started tattooing and getting tattooed, it's like, I always liked going to the old guys to get tattooed, because they always had all the cool stories, and, uh, you know, it's, it, that stuff, like I said before, it's like all that stuff, you know, someday it's all going to be gone, so it's, it's cool to have those uh, connections, and, you know, there's all these opportunities, tattooers that I didn't get tattooed from back when because, you know, you let the time go by and I'm so bummed that, like, I wasn't able to sit down with them. Like, I, you know, like, three times I tried to get tattooed from Zeke Owens, you know, but he was a hard one to nail down and it never happened. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, like, such a bummer to me. Whereas, like, you know, like, this tattoo is by Mike Malone and, you know, that was, like, such a treasure to me that, like, I went to Hawaii and, you know, Mike tattooed me and he sat me down and gave me a watercolor lesson and, uh, you know, and, and took me out to dinner afterwards just because he was like, oh, when I was, you know, if a tattooer came to town, you take him out to dinner, you know, that's what you do. And I was just like this little kid, basically. And I was like, 
1994 and I was just starting out and you know that he was so nice and so gracious and he let me flip through Sailor Jerry's photo books while I got tattooed you know and that was amazing. Not everybody can say that. No you know yeah. and that's like I, I treasure that and so it's like to have like these connections you know to these people that won't always be around you know is really special. Mm. And uh, if you would, would have to give uh, an advice to the younger people Right, uh, especially the people that just got into this, or they have been into this but not for so long, and they're still trying to find their place. Because eventually, you know, that's that's the change of generations. Like, what would you, uh, ad what would you tell them? I just to soak up what you can while it's available, because it won't always be available. And uh, you know, even if it's just you know your your neighborhood and having that connection to the things around you and but especially the people in the community and you know it's it's such an amazing community and, it, and tattooing can take you so many places it's like you just to make the most of it while you can nice michelle this was a pleasure you're like a literally living encyclopedia i have to still listen to this again and process all the stuff that you said and i'm sure this is like a fraction of what you you know know you can tell for people that would like to find you, but especially which I recommend this, I was talking about this the other day with a friend of mine and saying, okay, look, you're going to New York, you need, you need to check this out because it's something that has no price. So for people that would like to take your tour, know more, how do they find you? How do they? Uh, they go on my Instagram, Daredevil Michelle, but I'd say even if I'm not around to give the tour, it's like, um, you know, people should come to our shop and to see the collection that we have. I mean, Brad... Brad started collecting when he started tattooing, you know, probably, I don't know, like 35 years ago. And uh, it's it's a really incredible collection, and we really focus a lot on New York City history, of course. And uh, so it's, it's pretty cool that you can – it was very important to us to – have this and to have it available to the public and um you know we still try to you know get as much stuff as we can that is you know relative to new york city's history because you know so often this stuff goes into private hands and now we have to worry about you know like folk art collectors and stuff like people outside of the community are inst interested in it and you have all these people that like wouldn't have you know, step foot in a tattoo shop 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now they're trying to like, you know, buy up all this stuff. And so for us, it was just really important to have like this kind of a global resource for people. And we love that when tattooers come to visit and that we can share it with people, you know, and I mean, we had like, there was some like tattooer came in from, uh, Australia and they were like, wow, I've never seen antique flash in person. And so it's, it's, pretty cool to have people come in and that they can see the original Sundancer in our collection and you know that we have like one of the Edison pens there and and that also you can grab like one of these maps and you can yeah, actually definitely. see like where these people were like in relation to each other yeah. um so yeah I'd say just uh you know for us it's just about you know being able to share this with the tattoo community and people outside of the tattoo community yeah when I spoke to uh, Freddie Corbin, he said, you know, now it's everything is like Instagram messages and stuff. And the guy was like, people, pick up the phone, call me. I'm the <laughs> shop five days a week. You can stop by. Yeah. So this is definitely something like, you know, don't send a message. Don't just go to the shop, say hi, see make the things, connection. shake hands. Yeah, make mm -hmm. the connection, right? Yeah. Michelle, this was such a pleasure. <laughs> Let's see if anybody has some questions about this stuff at all. Yep. Yeah. I'm just gonna repeat. Yeah, I'm just gonna repeat in case I'm not sure if this goes through the microphone. So, what was the uh, official reason for the ban in New York? And uh that's a that's a good question. I mean, honestly, nobody uh, is a hundred percent sure why. There's a lot of different stories. The official reason was that they blamed it on a hepatitis outbreak, but I've heard stories that it was the same time they started. Um, Ta uh, immunizing the military for hepatitis and then um, I heard that there was some like well-to-do lady uh, was slumming it down the Bowery like people would go down there to kind of like gawk at all the crazy stuff and she went into Stanley and Walter's Moskowitz's shop on the Bowery and they threw her out and were not very nice to her and she was like you you're gonna regret this and 
I don't know. I used to hear stories that like Coney Island Freddie like beat up some senator's son, but then Mike McCabe said Coney Island Freddie was a sweetheart and wouldn't have done that. And so nobody, nobody really a hundred percent knows for sure. And then they also, it was also around the same time as the uh, New York World's Fair, and so they think maybe they, um, you know, wanted to kind of clean up the city uh, before the World's Fair. And I mean, I know like. Like most of the names and the dates on my on my map, I got from going through the city city directories year by year. And when I was going through it, I was like, "Oh, this is so exciting! I'm going to find all these names of people I've never heard of." You know, because every year there'd be more tattooers listed. But then in 1913, the Tro's directory merged with another company. They never listed another tattooer, and. So I was like, oh, I'll go backwards to before it was banned. I'll go to the 1960 Yellow Pages. And so the 1960 Yellow Pages, it says tattoo artist, and all it has is one guy listed for tattoo removal. And so it just goes to show, like, culturally what they thought of tattooing. They were like, yeah, we don't want these guys in our book. And so it was just, it was so frowned upon and, you know, and so, like, you know, undesirable. And like, I've, I've even heard that when Charlie Wagner passed away, the city went into his space and they took everything and they took it to the dump. And so it was, you know, literally garbage to them. And so I think it was just, they just didn't like it and they didn't want it. And this image, this, uh, any kind of excuse, but the official reason was hepatitis, but I don't think anyone was ever actually directly linked to getting it. I mean, I don't know, considering that back then it's like, you know, the old guys would work with like a, what, a bucket of Listerine and a sponge. It's like, I don't know, everybody would be dead if it was that <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> Any other question? So how tattoo uh, spread from the Bowery, which was kind of like the birthplace, and how he went from there? It uh, it had a very strong, you know, naval tradition, as we all know, like with the sailors and everything. And so you, you had like, it was definitely a money-making thing, like at all these different ports, like all over the world. But I think uh, definitely New York City made its contribution because you had artists like, you had Charlie Wagner, who had his supply company, and you had this innovation going on in New York City with the first electric machine patents were in New York. And so I think that definitely if somebody wanted to get into it and they went to New York City, they might try to buy equipment from Wagner and it spread to the other places. But even back then, like you find articles with some of the tattooers from back then and you know, a lot of them were sailors and they would like settle in some other places. But I think um, uh, it was a money maker for people and you definitely, since you had like the the supply companies there, it, that also helped to spread it from New York City. Awesome. Any other question? No. All right, Michelle. This was a pleasure. People, Michelle Miles, thank you so much for the lesson. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much.